Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Navigating the Journey. And today's journey is in Detroit, of all places. But that's the headline, right? Detroit. And we're going to visit with my cousin, the Reverend Nicholas Hood III. And so, Nick, how are you, darling? Hello, Cousin Marsh. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> yeah. Um, we come from a huge family and names are used over and over and over again. So he's Nicholas III, actually. And um, Nick and I, our mothers had the same name, Elizabeth Hood. So I think the last time I visited with Nick, we told you about how far back we go to, to the Hood Plantation, but we won't go there today. Today, we are talking about going from the plantation, from picking cotton to picking presidents. And the, where we're going with this, of course, Detroit is in the headlines all over the world about what the Republicans are trying to do. Uh, to the vote in Detroit and uh, Philadelphia, other major cities. So as a background, let me say this and um, why those cities? There are 20, according to the census, according to the 2010 census, there are 20 major cities that are more than 53% black. So those are the cities that all voted for Biden. And so now the GOP is trying to undo those cities. So their first was Detroit and now they tried with Philadelphia, but the court said no good. Uh, and so we're going back to Nick and Detroit. So, Tell us, Nick, about Detroit, what it's like, and this huge voter turnout, and what is going on with Detroit. Well, first of all, uh, let me say, Cousin Marcia, thank you very <laughs> much for inviting me to be back on your show. And uh, for your guests who may not know it, I am a reverend. I, I pastor a church, Plymouth United Church of Christ in Detroit. It's uh, in the same uh, United Church of Christ that is all over Hawaii and the Congregational Church mm -hmm. uh, that uh, is also, you know, prevalent in Hawaii. And uh, I used to be on the Detroit City Council. So part of the reason why my cousin Marsha has invited me to be on this is because part of my life has been political and still is. Uh, but uh, Marsha, you and I were talking about uh, the significance of coming from a people who once picked cotton uh, and you know, not because they chose to pick cotton, but they were forced to pick cotton. And now we're picking presidents. And that's an amazing uh, transition, you know, over 400 years. Uh, but you are absolutely right. Uh, the 20 or so cities that are majority African-American really put uh, Joseph Biden over the top. He received more uh, votes than any other person ever in the history of America running for president. And uh, even though the current president uh, refuses to formally concede, this election is over. And uh, the, but you know, in politics, uh, electoral politics, it's not just important to amass uh, your vote uh, and get your vote out and, and try to win an election. But then the next challenge in, is sometimes greater than getting elected or, or electing a president, which is getting rewards, getting some kind of uh, tribute or uh, some benefit from having elected a president. And, and I think that's the real challenge now for the African-American communities around uh, the country. Uh, it's not just the African-American uh, populations. 
in this election, uh, you had Florida, which uh, in, in a major way, uh, the Cuban vote and some of the other you know, Hispanic Latino votes went for Trump. And uh, you know, I think the Democratic Party has got to ask itself why. You know, why did that happen? You know, why did they resonate more with Trump than with Biden? But back to those of us who voted for Biden, I think the real challenge now is, can, can we elicit a, a uh, urban strategy, uh, urban dollars, urban uh, programs from the Biden administration uh, commensurate to the vote that put him into office? Well, I was, I'm a member of the Democratic Party, but in Hawaii, what else? Um, and I was an elector four times. Uh, but anyway, I'll tell you that story later. And what I was upset with the Democratic Party is that um, Mark, Mike Ashby did not get support from the party. And even though in, in Mississippi, even though um, Harrison, with all that money that he gathered, he still didn't get all the votes. And I don't know what the party did or did not do in um, South Carolina and in Mississippi. It, all of the, across the South, the numbers of Blacks are raised, rising and rising and rising. And yet it seemed like those states just nobody paid attention to them. I don't know what that meant. I, I really don't know. But after I found out that we have to support Georgia, I decided I'd leave the party alone until it's over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You know, um, now my one, one story, uh, 19, summer of 64, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer from Mississippi, Ruleville, Mississippi, and they created the, um, the not the black, but um, Mississippi Freedom uh, delegation to do go to the convention in Atlantic City. And of course, uh, it was totally integrated, male, female, black, and white. And the delegation that was there, of course, was all male and all white. And so she, they worked at this for the summer of 64. They really worked at this, of gathering people, raising funds to get to Atlantic City from Mississippi. And uh, we were stationed, my husband was stationed in New Jersey. And I had one little girl and I was 99 months pregnant. So we decided being activists um, in the military, my husband was in the military, uh, and Senator Douglas from Illinois was trying to close the commissaries. And my husband made the whole $309 a month. And so all we had was the commissary, you know, we didn't have anything. Well, so we decided to go to the convention and picket Senator Douglas. So off I went and my husband said, now, if you have that baby down there, don't even call me. Don't even call me. He said, I've never seen anything like the way you love going after politicians, sheer joy. So I get to Atlantic City and here are all these people on the boardwalk black, white, pink, green, you name it. Oh, the place was packed. And I did not know what was going on. However, because of my skin color, the police moved me in with the crowd. So I get to be part of this whole thing that's going on at the convention, simply because of the way I look, naturally. And so that was when Fannie Lou Hamer did this great speech about not accepting two seats, even though Martin Luther King said, take it. She said, no, no, we all came this far and we're all tired 
and we all want to sit. We will not take the two seats. So anyway, it was a national, uh, they televised her speech and LBJ got really upset and he tried to take it off the air and he did some other stuff. But anyway, it got through on the evening news so everybody got to watch. And people from across the country sent in telegrams in those days, give her our seats, give her our seats. We're, we're glad. Anyway, it changed from that day to this. It changed the face of the Democratic Party. Now, every delegation has to have male, female, black, white, pink, green, whatever you got. It has to be that way. Most people have no idea. And that's why I was upset with the Democratic Party. She's from Mississippi. There's no way they should have not supported Mississippi better than they did. Now, now that you know my whole story, <laughs> let's, get, let's get back to Detroit. So I think, Nick, you gotta help me with this one. I think the reason the GOP picked Detroit, not all of, of Michigan, just Detroit, not the county, the cities around it, just Detroit and Philadelphia, because those are major black cities and Trump has been anti-black forever. So that's my theory on that. So help me, tell well, me. Well, it's, uh, I, I think uh, Trump is just a sore, sour loser. Uh, he, he has lost the election fair and square. So, and you know, he's just grasping at straws right now. But the New York Times today on the front page um, had a uh, article about the, the people who supported uh, Biden and that by and large, uh, all across the country, and I presume this is all the way to Hawaii as well, the uh, counties that uh, lost the most economically in the last four years are the ones that went the most for Biden. And, uh, you know, as uh, was it Bill Clinton who said it's the economy stupid? You know, and, and that's not a white or black issue. No. Uh, that's not an Asian, that's not an African issue. It's you either have money or you don't. And uh, the reality is that under Donald Trump, the rich got richer and the poor got poor. And matter of fact, the income divide has even expanded. And so uh, the last time I think I was talking with you, we were talking about the impact of the Black Lives Matter. Yes. And how for the first time in my life, I, it, which is really not true because during uh, the freedom rides of the civil rights movement, uh, there were a lot of young white people who oh, yeah. gathered together with uh, young black people and helped to bring about the civil rights le legislation of 1964, 65. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but Andrew Young, who he's the last of the living original group with Dr. King, uh, he was ordained by my father. Oh, and we, I don't know if I mentioned that the last time, but you no, know, uh, I rem he was so young, but okay. Anyway, well, uh, let, me, no, let, me, let me just ahead, share, share with you something that Andrew Young said, which is that if it were not for the white, in particular, young white freedom riders who took the buses down with John Lewis. Uh, he said we would not have the civil rights le legislation that we have right now because the Congress, yeah. the Senate, uh, LBJ, they all resonated with seeing young white people that look like they could be their own children. And uh, this past election was not just turned on the, the backs of black people and the black vote, it was also the white vote. And the thing I worry about in the uh, years ahead, these next uh, four years, is that the coalition that came together to defeat Donald Trump, and I think it was a stronger coalition to defeat Trump than to elect Biden. 
I agree with that. That, that agree with coalition yeah. is a very fragile coalition. We have people on the very, very far left, the progressives, um, and you know the so-called prog progressives and uh, liberal wing, the left wing of the uh, Democratic Party. But you also have a whole lot of other people who um, they you know they just want to live good lives. And, and take advantage of this great country that is here for all of us. And so I really pray for that fragile union. Uh, I think the numbers are showing throughout the country that more and more people are dissatisfied with the Republican Party. And it's, it's not just the name of the Republican Party because that's not it. I mean, the Republican Party uh, for years was the party for black people. You know, because that was the party of Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. that emancipated the slaves. But nowadays, you know, it seems to be the party of the super rich. And uh, with our economic scale that we have in America today, there are fewer super rich people than there are just people who are barely getting by. Well, you mentioned in Hawaii, uh, there. First of all, let me say all of our uh, electoral, electoral votes went to Biden, but we only have four anyway. However, 39% of the population voted for Trump, 39%. And since I'm an old time Democrat, I count numbers and I know the districts and all, well, I shouldn't say all, most of those 39% are in very wealthy neighborhoods. So yeah, the 39% well, that, that voted for him, yeah. Yeah, that's well. That's exactly and, what you're saying, yeah. Right, and that was the point of the New York Times article today. You know, when we think about the people who support Trump, uh, yes, they're the white supremacists. Uh, yes, you know, they're the people who uh, are on the, some of them are on the bottom rung of society. Many of them are um, young white males without higher education. Uh, but frankly, uh, education and a lack thereof doesn't know party. What people really wanna know is, if I vote for you, is it going to benefit my bottom line? Now, one of the surprises in this election was that Hispanic males and, his, and, and black males, to some extent, uh, voted more for Trump than for Biden. And you know we saw that in some of the young hip hop artists, uh, is it Lil Wayne, I think Ice-T, and you had Kanye West who ran a uh, divisive campaign to really, I think, undercut the black vote. And, you know, they, they picked up some young, some black men, but they were not just young black men. There were some older yes. black men who were voting according to what they thought would benefit their pension. Well, I thought also about the entertainers that they make millions of dollars and Trump benefits them in the tax bracket. Correct. Yeah, Correct. That's, what, that's what I thought about them. This is about their taxes. Yes, yeah, so yeah. this election was not just about black people voting against Trump. It was also people voting with their pocketbooks. There were people voting with their heads uh, and voting with their hearts. Uh, there are a lot of white people in America who really have been touched by you know, the killings of George Floyd and, and others uh, at the hands of the police. And, and many of these people are asking hard questions and some of them are not just, um, you know, people of uh, who you think would normally vote democratic. Uh, it has really touched America. And um, I'm on a board in Detroit for the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. And one of the things that we've been talking about for the last six months is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's amazing to me because the people who are pushing the most to make sure that the symphony, uh, which, you know, when you think of symphonic music and symphonic organizations, that's predominantly white. 
but the people who are really pushing for it are the super rich uh, board members. And when I talk about super rich, these are people who may give at least a million dollars a year to keep the symphony afloat. You know, and, and it's a small group of people, you know, who can do that. But the point that I'm making is that I think the nation is really revisiting the whole question of going back to slavery and the aftermath of slavery, what is the appropriate response for America? And I think I was sharing with you when we were talking offline the other day when I learned that you had been raised in Baltimore and I was asking you questions about Frederick Douglass who lived for a long time in Baltimore. Uh, one of the points that Frederick Douglass makes and you know he's the most photographed person, black or white, in the 1800s in America. But one of the points he makes is that white people seem to be um, seem to like blacks more when they were enslaved and in poverty than when black people climbed out of poverty uh, and were just trying to make it, you know, in the American economy. And uh, the, the reality that Frederick Douglass was talking about back in the 1800s is still true today, which is America, in my opinion, has not come to grips with the aftermath of slavery. We don't, as a nation, the nation doesn't know what to do with it. And actually sometimes it becomes very uncomfortable when a black man, a black woman uh, come of financial means. And that just means, I, I don't think it's an impossible challenge. I don't think it's an impossible hurdle, but what I think it means is that the nation has a long way to go. We've come a long way. And the fact that the nation turned away from Donald Trump this year uh, is a huge statement. It, it, to me, what it says is the people wanna move on to a, a mindset that's more productive, more positive and more meaningful. And Frankly, that doesn't have anything to do with being white or black. It's just, you know, how do you, how do you improve the quality of life for everybody? Well, I, 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 I agree with you. And I think that while we are basically a Christian nation, even though we're not supposed to be, but we are, or, or, I shouldn't say Christian because there's an awful lot of Jewish people and Baha'i and Buddhist and you know and it's Islamic. Islam and and that is that basic tenet, that very basic, and it doesn't matter whether you're using the Jewish Torah or the Christian Bible, the basic is the Beatitudes, how you care for people. And I think people, and that's why they like Joe Biden, because he comes from that Christian belief that you care for people, the empathy, the telling the truth, uh, wanting to feed the hungry, all of that that we all somehow grow up with. And I think people wanted that again. They liked that, uh, that caring for people by the government and everybody. And I think that's what we voted for, that we want to go, want to do that again. Well, Cousin Marsha, I would say you're very idealistic. I, <laughs> I think that, uh, I don't think this was a, a vote about Biden at all. This was a vote against Trump. Well, that's what I, I and, meant, that we wanted to get rid of that lying and deceit and all of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This was clearly, in my mind, a vote against. Oh, yes. Candidate. And it was against Donald Trump. Yes. Against a man who said that uh, he could shoot a person in the middle of Fifth Avenue and, you know, uh, his people would still support him. A man who, you know, cel was celebrated for groping women in their private parts uh, and making, you know, just disgusting, humiliating, uh, uh, derogatory comments about people who he felt were outside of the norm. And I think the basic uh, person in America just was turned off by that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the real question in my mind that Joseph Biden has now is how does he build upon this coalition that he, that he benefited from? 
Uh, I don't I don't think a lot of people were crazy about voting for Joseph Biden, but they were resolute in voting against Donald Trump. On election day, you should have seen my polling place. I was there at seven in the morning and uh, with my wife and we were number 20 in line. I, I was disappointed. I thought we should have been number 100 or 300 in line, but we were number 20 in line, but the, and it was cold out, you know, the weather was bad, but the people had a resolute face. It was like, we are not gonna tolerate Donald Trump for another four years. And so I think the American democracy really uh, showed itself for what it is this past election contrary to what Donald Trump has said, the election was fair. He's tried to chip away at that in several states, but the reality is, is uh, it was a fair election. It was so fair, I, go ahead. I, I agree with you. I absolutely agree. So I was starting to tell you before we went on air that uh, a young woman that I supported who ran for judge thought on election night, she thought she lost the election, but today, because of the slow, thorough counting in Detroit, she, it was, she was running for one of two seats and the two top vote getters she thought were white, but she ended up winning uh, the election by a surprise by about you know less than 1%. And she beat a white candidate with a very strong uh, political name in Detroit, Hathaway. And uh, the guy had changed his name to Hathaway and she beat him. And, and what Trump is going to find out is if he actually goes through a recount or all across America, I think Biden's uh, vote tally is just going to increase. I agree, totally agree. And uh, even though uh, after all he did ugly about in McCain in Arizona, why he thought he could win when McCain was a patron saint of Arizona. It beats the dog crap out of me. Listen, darling, we have just another minute or so to go. Tell me the future of, of your city. Where you, after the election, the people that won, the people that didn't win, where are we going with your city? Since you're one of the major, major cities well, Cousin Marsha, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be on your show. And uh, Detroit will be all right. Detroit uh, is about 80% Black. We have uh, 140 square miles of land in Detroit. We sit on uh, the freshest water in the world. Believe it or not, you know, we, Aquafina, do you ever drink Aquafina water? I have, yes. They bottle it in Detroit. Pepsi bottles it straight out of the Detroit River. The Detroit River is a fast river. Matter of fact, what Detroit, Detroit means is the city of the streets. The water's fast. And because it's fast, the algae doesn't get to stick uh, to the, the water. And so Detroit will be fine. Uh, the big three are working on artificial intelligence and uh, electric vehicles. Uh, the city will do just fine. Uh, but the city is a microcosm of the rest of America. And, uh, you know, what America is trying to figure out is how can we live better? And uh, Detroit is right in that mix. So I thank you for the opportunity to be on your show. And uh, maybe if I'm uh, lucky, you'll have me back. I, of course I will. And for anybody that's, everybody that's watching, uh, the good reverend, sends me his sermon every Sunday. So I feel honored to be on your email list. Thank you very and, much. Yeah, and so anybody that wants to be <laughs> on his email list, it's Reverend Nicholas Hood, Plymouth, Plymouth Nicholas what? Hood, the, Nicholas Hood the third. The third. Just, just Google Nicholas Hood the third and they, yeah. they'll be able to figure it out. But we want them to enjoy you as much as I do. And thank you so much for being my guest. And we will do this again. All right. Thank you so much. God bless. Aloha.